the film confirmed our worst fears about what was living in the closet and what was hiding under the bed. They're here. In the summer of 1982, the horror flick Poltergeist became the ultimate fright fest. But the real terror was behind the scenes. He was white as a ghost, and we just were, you know, like, Brian, it's going to be OK. In the next two hours, we'll explore the tales and myths surrounding the Poltergeist films and expose a reality that is stranger than fiction. He felt that there was some alien spirits that were upset, and he detected it in the skeletons. And I began to get very creeped out about this. It's somebody trying to send me a message that I shouldn't be doing this film. We'll unveil the strange and bizarre events that happened on the set. He came to me sweating, very uncomfortable, and he said, the set needs an exorcism. Finally, we'll reveal how the filmmakers coped with tragedy. One of the worst moments of my life, carrying a box with that beautiful little girl in it. Some say the casts and crews of the Poltergeist movies were simply unlucky, but others believe the movies were hexed. This is the story of the curse of Poltergeist, the E! True Hollywood story. It was about the dream of being one of the world's Her life's stars. ambition was, was to be a star. Hollywood has enjoyed a long love affair with horror movies, mysteries, and ghoulish tales. But sometimes, what happens behind the scenes is more bizarre than anything Hollywood dreams up. No one knows that better than the casts and crews of the hit Poltergeist films. The freak accidents, untimely deaths, and acts of violence that occurred off camera led to speculation that the movies are somehow cursed. Some dismiss the curse of Poltergeist as an urban myth. Many don't. You be the judge. The movie Poltergeist was the brainchild of Steven Spielberg. In 1982, the 35-year-old director was already a major force in Hollywood. His resume included blockbusters like Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Spielberg was fascinated with all things frightening. Even as a kid growing up in suburban Scottsdale, Arizona, Steven enjoyed terrorizing his three younger sisters. It seems like he's Stephen's always been trying to scare us. It started probably, I can recall, in about sec when I was about in second grade. And my little sister and I were sharing a room, and he, I had a new blackboard. And he came in and drew a skull face with big, scary eyes, and bloodshot eyes, and a, uh, in chalk on my blackboard. And he said, which one of you can sleep with this image without telling mom? <laughs> and so this thing's staring at us. And the two of us, like, neither one of us wanted to chicken out, you know. And finally, we both said, go. And we ran out of bed and got my mom, and she erased it. As Stephen became older, his pranks became more diabolical. He used to do some pretty incredible things, um, such as he created a monster out of an old skull he had, and he dripped red wax over it and put weird flashlights and gels shining on it. And then he threw us one at a time in the closet, making us wear, wear special sunglasses to help the effect. And then he locked the closet door and wait for our screams. <laughs> Spielberg learned an important lesson. His victims loved to be scared. We'd sit in our rooms going, what's he going to do now? <laughs> and a part of us just couldn't wait, like, oh, there's something fun's going to happen. But at the same time, as, as a kid, you just I had butterflies. It wasn't long before Spielberg combined his love of horror with his other passion, making movies. Oh, he's always filming everything. He would take my Barbie dolls and he'd put on music from Spartacus. And he'd walk, like the death march, he'd walk Barbie up to the scaffold and film her hanging, you know? <laughs> so he did very macabre things with, with our toys, but it, we all thought this was normal, you know? Growing up, we all thought everybody did this in their houses. I guess that wasn't the case. By the spring of 1980, Spielberg was in the middle of filming his next movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That summer, the director became obsessed with an idea for the ultimate haunted house movie, e-online film critic Andy Jones. Saying the film in a suburban location sort of um, intensifies the scare factor because you know what? Most horror movies and scary haunted, haunted house movies, they're set like, you know, it's spooky castles you shouldn't be going into anyway. Don't go in that building. 
You know, these are the buildings that you want to stay away from. But, a, you know, a neighborhood like in the suburbs where every building is beige and the kids all look the same and you know everyone goes to the same PTA meeting and the high school's right down the block, that's not the place where you expect to find, you know, ghosts and scary things. You feel very safe in these communities. And I think that's, um, that's exactly where Spielberg kind of got us. While finishing Raiders of the Lost Ark, Spielberg knocked out an outline for Poltergeist, a story about an ordinary suburban family terrorized by ghosts. Spielberg and Raiders producer Frank Marshall took the project to MGM and sold it on the spot. There was one problem. Spielberg was committed to direct another project. When Spielberg signed on for Poltergeist with MGM, he was already under contract with Universal on ET, which sort of forbade him to direct another movie, specifically Poltergeist. Obviously, Universal didn't want to have these two movies competing. Spielberg wasn't thrilled, but he found a solution. Steven's deal at Universal didn't prevent him from producing Poltergeist. Named directors clamored for the job, but Spielberg picked 37-year-old Toby Hooper, whose 1974 low-budget shocker, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, was considered a horror classic. Spielberg had his director, but he still needed a script. In 1980, Stephen met with two up-and-coming screenwriters, Mark Victor and Michael Grace. The director actually had the duo in mind for another project. We were at his house and he was showing us a guy named Joe which later became a movie and wanted to know if we wanted to write that. And then we were talking about ghost stories, I think, during the night in Twilight Zones. When Spielberg revealed he was developing his own ghost story, the writers wanted in. Stephen had some notes for uh, an idea. When Michael and I walked outside, we both kind of looked at each other and said, I'd rather do the ghost story. <laughs> so we called Stephen and said, hey, you know that ghost story? We'd rather do the ghost story. We, we didn't know that calling Stephen and telling him that we didn't want to do one movie and, <laughs> and we, we wanted to do an, a, a different one was, a, uh, was not something that most people don't usually do. We hadn't been in the business that long. But Spielberg liked their moxie. Grace and Victor got the job. The director demanded realism. And Stephen had us meeting with psychics and ghost hunters and uh, all kinds of the most bizarre people we'd ever imagined. There was some guy up in uh, the hills who we met with who supposedly could see ghosts. And we were wandering around some old mansion and he goes, see, there's one there. And we'd look up and, be, you know, and there would be nothing there. You know, we go, oh yeah. For true inspiration, Spielberg and his writers reached back to their own childhood fears. We just thought about everything that scared us as kids. You know, nightmares, fantasies, dreams, whatever. And we all contributed stories about, you know, the usual things kids are afraid of, you know, the, the dark closet, the what's under the bed. Stephen was afraid of a lot of things, and he was really, really frightened of clowns, and not only clowns, but trees. Stephen was very much afraid of a tree, a particular tree that grew in our backyard, and this tree, when it would storm or, or there'd be um, wind, would scratch on his window, and he was just deathly afraid of this tree. And in Poltergeist, there's an incredible image of the tree coming and grabbing the little boy, and it's, I mean, when I saw that, I just went, oh my gosh, he captured the fear that he had and really put it into the film. But the writers wanted to go way beyond clowns and scary trees. We had a lunch with Stephen, and we, we sat him down, and we said, Stephen, in order for this to really have impact. And be different. And be different. A lot of people have to die. <laughs> he goes, how many? We said, the whole family. We said, we want, <laughs> we want to kill the whole family. And he, he stopped and he said, at the end of the meeting, it was a nice compromise. He said, only one. And we looked at each other and went, the little girl. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it was the beginning of the process. Victor and Grace later changed their minds about killing the little girl. They turned in their completed script in the fall of 1980. Steven Spielberg and director Toby Hooper needed to find a group of actors who looked like no harm could ever come to them. Your typical next door neighbors. The first call went to 32-year-old Jo Beth Williams. The actress was best known for her role in the 1979 Academy Award winning film, Kramer vs. Kramer. My agent called me and said, we're sending you a script called Poltergeist. And uh, I went, oh, you know, a horror movie. No, I'm not interested um, in my snobby little way. 
And uh, then they said, well, Steven Spielberg is producing this. And I went, oh, well, then I guess I'll read it. The actress loved the script and signed on to play the role of a housewife terrorized by ghosts. Williams was already a believer in the supernatural. I was doing summer stock in um, New Hampshire, and a bunch of the actors were living in this boarding house. And I had a dream, or what I thought was a dream one night, that the bed was shaking. And I, I thought, well, maybe we're having an earthquake. Uh, and I woke up in the morning and I went down to breakfast and the lady who owned the house, you know, serving breakfast and I said, wow, I had the weirdest dream. I thought we were having an earthquake because the bed was shaking. She said, oh no dear, that's just our ghost. And I went, ghost? She said, oh yes, it's been here for years, nothing to worry about. Jo Beth had an actor in mind to play her husband, 35-year-old Craig T. Nelson. Jo Beth and I had worked in Stir Crazy and then she got a part in uh, the poltergeist first one and uh, she I think suggested me to Steven Spielberg then I came in and uh, read for it and auditioned for it and got it to play the film's mysterious exorcist Spielberg looked for someone more unconventional 45 year old Zelda Rubinstein auditioned for the part like Joe Beth Williams Zelda had first-hand experience with the unknown I had been living in London for a very long time, and uh, one night I was having a dream, like a little cartoon image of my dog back in California, and said, I have to go now, I'm so tired, but I had to say goodbye, and he went out the right side of my vision, and I woke up immediately screaming because I knew my dog had died. And in just a couple hours, my mother called from California to say the dog had died, very mysteriously. Rubenstein had the goods. She won the role. 21-year-old Dominique Dunn and 7-year-old Oliver Robbins signed on to play two of the family's children. But Spielberg and Hooper still needed to find Carol Ann, the youngest child and the poltergeist's special victim. The film promised to be a monster hit, but little did the filmmakers know there were monstrous surprises right around the corner. Coming up, life imitates art. I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I can take months of this. And later... He delivered the line the way he did because he knew that he was going to die. In the spring of 1981, producer Steven Spielberg was ready to shoot his movie, Poltergeist. He had his script, director, and most of his cast. But Spielberg still hadn't found the right child to play the ghost's innocent target. Spielberg searched far and wide for his Carol Ann. One of the actresses he considered was six-year-old Drew Barrymore. I remember that so vividly. Um, I met with Stephen. I originally went in for Poltergeist, actually. And he took one look at me and said, you're wrong for that movie. And I was sort of like, oh, God, I'm in the wrong place. And he was like, but I think you're right for this other movie. That other movie was E.T. Spielberg kept looking for the ideal girl for Poltergeist and found her in an unlikely place. Agent Bob Preston represented five-year-old Heather O'Rourke. Heather's older sister, Tammy, was working on a feature film at the MGM lot called Pennies from Heaven. In the MGM commissary, uh, Kathy O'Rourke, Heather's mother, asked Heather to sit down and save the seats for them. So while Heather is uh, sitting there by herself, the stranger came up, glasses, beard, sort of long hair, and said, hi, what's your name? And she said, well, my name is Heather O'Rourke, but you're a stranger and I can't talk to you. And he said, well, do you mind if I sit here until your mother comes back? And she said, well, she didn't say anything about that, but yes, you can sit down until she comes, but that's her seat. And okay, fine. So this man sat down, talked to Heather while they were waiting for the food to come. Sure enough, mom comes back with a tray full of food and the sister. The man gets up and said, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Steven Spielberg. At that point, mom drops the tray on the table. Everything spills. Steven asked how old she was. She said, well, I'm five. She said, well, I need someone that's sick. She said, okay, just proceed to eat her sandwich. 
And then a day or so later, he came up and says, in the commissary again, he said, how are you again, Heather? Next thing we know, we were given a card to be interviewed. They met with Heather by herself, and uh, Mr. Spielberg said, would you mind taking the script outside and have your mom sort of read the lines to you and hopefully you can memorize it? And Heather said, I can read. And he goes, well, sure, and just sort of joking along with her. She goes, no, really, and she picked up the script and started reading it. They related back and forth, and she screamed and cried and followed his direction. She said, could she go home now? She was done screaming. He said, you sure could. And next thing we know, she had the job. Filming began in May 1981 in Simi Valley, California, a quiet suburb 40 miles north of Los Angeles. No one anticipated any major problems, but right from the start, production was grueling. Actor James Karen. It was a very hot day, a new crew, and it, it, was, uh, it was a rough, rough day's shoot for a first day. It would be rough for any day. Even the neighbors were exhausted. George Rakowski lived across the street from the poltergeist house. The main complaint of most of the neighbors was that the, uh, the shooting was going around or going on at, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning and there were explosions and noises and sounds and you couldn't sleep and lights were blurring and, and uh, it was just, it was a distraction. Things didn't get any easier for Spielberg and company when they moved into an MGM soundstage. In the summer of 1981, the Writers Guild went on strike. Mark Victor and Michael Grace went with them. We were uh, ordered by our guild to be picketing while the movie was shooting uh, inside. It was a very strange situation for us. We were outside of uh, MGM picketing our movie that was being shot inside Poltergeist and uh, someone came out and found us and said, come on, we'll sneak you in the back door. <laughs> so they came out and got us and brought us in the back door so that we could go to the set and spend a few hours on the set and see what was going on. And we were escorted back out to the picket line and continued our, our protest. Steven Spielberg was on set every day, but he couldn't give Poltergeist his undivided attention. He was also making E.T. and getting ready to do E.T. It was in pre-production, and I can remember him talking about it and uh, how maybe it was going to be a, a pretty big film, something that he was excited about. Despite the chaos, the cast seemed unaffected, at least for the moment. Oh, Dominique was uh, just a delightful young woman. I mean, Dominique was 21, I think, playing 16, full of life, full of energy. You know, a lot of jokes about her playing a teenager when she was really a young woman. Ollie. He was so tiny. I mean, he's just a little guy, you know, and he was fun. He was pro and ready to go to work. Unlike her character, Heather O'Rourke wasn't phased by the movie's eerie plot. If I cried in a scene, she would cry. If I seemed scared in a scene, she would totally take her cue off me and she would become scared. To the point where I began to get worried and I said, you know, Heather, I'm just acting. She said, I know, so am I. And I went, oh, okay, <laughs> I'll just back off. For the children, the movie was fun and make-believe, but for Jo Beth Williams and Craig T. Nelson, it was a different story. It was physically very hard, um, just a lot of running and screaming and dirt being thrown at us and skeletons being <laughs> thrown at us and it was, I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I can take months of this. It just seemed like you were consistently wet and cold all the time. That's what I remember as it, it being difficult. It, it, or covered in gel, which was uh, the afterbirth of something. Whatever it was, it had a lot of alcohol in it, and so it made your body very cold. And, you know, little Heather and I had to be covered in this for long hours while we were shooting in the bathtub. It was pretty uncomfortable. But not nearly as uncomfortable as one of the film's elaborate sets, a rotating bedroom. I was really scared about getting on that ride um, because I'd never done anything like I mean, few people have done anything like that. Um, and, you know, the way it worked was that the cameraman um, was 
strapped, he and the camera were, were strapped to the set so that they rotated. And basically, I stayed in place, but I had to slide with the set. And we did it over and over and over again. And the people who had built the set had so faithfully recreated the bedroom set that they had even recreated the cottage cheese ceiling, which scraped and scratched me every time I went around. So after about the 20th take, I was I had sort of scrapes and some blood on my elbows and my knees, which were exposed because of what I was wearing. And I remember I got off and I said, you know, Stephen, I'm bleeding. And he said, it's okay, we can wipe it away, it'll never show. <laughs> and I said, well, I really appreciate your sympathy. As life on set became more difficult, life at home became more bizarre. Dominique had a weird experience while she was making the movie. You know, soon after the production started on the film, she was staying in the house. A bookshelf falls over, throws books all over the room that was bolted into the wall. I was living in an apartment in L.A. because I was from New York, and I would come home every evening, and the pictures in the apartment would be crooked, and I would straighten them, and I would go to bed, and I'd get up really early and go to work the next day. And I'd come home late at night after a long, exhausting day, and the pictures would be crooked again. And I began to get very creeped out about this. I began to think, is somebody trying to send me a message that I shouldn't be doing this film, you know, that there's something wrong with me dealing with this subject? Coming up. The lights flickered and went on, and then all the video games in the room started playing themselves. By June of 1981, Steven Spielberg was in the second month of shooting his horror film, Poltergeist. But a string of mysterious episodes was already pushing his cast and crew to the edge. The long days on the Poltergeist set and the disturbing incidents at home were clearly catching up with Jo Beth Williams. We were so tired because the days were so exhausting. We all began to get hypersensitive to noises, sounds, you know, jumpy. Um, lights that see things sort of flash by. And I think people were more susceptible to being creeped out because of the material that we were dealing with. You know, you, when you sort of ha have to put yourself, especially as actors, in a state of terror all the time, um, you begin to overreact to things. The actors constantly wondered what would happen next. Shooting the movie's last scene was a terrifying ordeal for Williams. The muddy swimming pool was actually on a set. It was um, at MGM in the old Esther Williams tank. They had built the pool. And then they put these huge lights, giant lights around it to light it, and then huge, what they call Ritter fans that are like 16 feet across to blow and create the sort of wind in the atmosphere. And I've always been very um, sort of one of my fears is electricity um, and water. and. So I would see these huge fans and these huge lights and it would make me very scared to get into the water because I thought, well, what if one fell in and somebody bumped into it accidentally because there's, you know, a million crew members around. But producer Steven Spielberg didn't let his leading lady down. Steven Spielberg put on waders and waded into the pool and stood, you know, out of camera range on the side in the water. And he said, I want you to know, that if a light falls in and it's going to electrocute you, it'll electrocute me too. And I felt much better. And fortunately, neither of us fried. Cast members weren't the only ones dealing with stress. Director Toby Hooper had his own issues. My recollections of Toby was that I believe he had a vision as director slightly different from that of Steven Spielberg, his producer, and very frequently Steven made adjustments to the shots that Toby set up. I'm sure it was hard for Toby at, at, at times because Steven is very strong. He's a very strong personality. His knowledge is just sort of breathtaking. And he was there all the time. I think you could really feel that Steven was very actively involved. And I'm sure sometimes that, you know, that was frustrating. 
It was also frustrating for the rest of the crew. Special effects makeup artist Craig Reardon was in charge of creating a ghostly piece of meat. In the script, the uh, steak became cancerous. That's the actual word that was used. And so Toby saw that as something uh, that had been deformed with tumors. So, uh, because that's the way he saw it, I, I actually sculpted something and I brought it to the set for his approval. And he liked it, he approved it. Steven Spielberg walked up and said, what's that? And uh, I said, that's the steak. And he said, no, I don't think so. And he said, I think, I think we better keep it looking like a steak, otherwise the audience will get lost. And I could see his logic, and, but I thought, hmm, you know, a lot of work just went into this, which is now ash can. So from that point on, I made certain that everything got run through Steven Spielberg. Spielberg's influence was palpable. There's a scene where a man is hallucinating that his face is dissolving, and that was vintage Steve. He'd come in to tell us a bedtime story. He'd first take wet toilet paper, plaster it on his face, and he'd come in and he'd scream in these claws. He would just start, ah, you know, and ripping his skin off and throwing it towards us. <laughs> With Spielberg standing on the sidelines, Craig Reardon wasn't going to take any chances. It was necessary for a pair of hands to come up and actually tear into this face. Now, uh, guess whose hands? Steven Spielberg. And the reason for that was very simple. I wanted him to look at it in dailies and not say, who the hell was pulling that apart? They really did a lousy job. <laughs> Spielberg's hands-on involvement fueled rumors that he had taken over Hooper's directing duties. But cast members insist this was not the case. I saw Toby there every day, and I saw Spielberg there every day. And on any picture, the producer talks to you and uh, the director talks to you. And I didn't think any, anything uh, odd about it, about the arrangement. I mean, Toby certainly had his fair share of input, too. We're clear that we were working with both of these people. It didn't affect me. I was, I was happy to have both of them around. So, um, you know, if there were resentments, they were kept away from me. In August 1981, Toby Hooper called cut for the last time. The cast left the set exhausted and happy to put the project behind them. But there was more drama. MGM executives hired author James Kahn to write a poltergeist novel as a promotional tool for the release of the movie. I didn't have an office per se, but Stephen's office on the then MGM lot was open because he was, uh, that's where he was filming E.T. So I just ensconced myself in his office for that month and wrote 15, 18 hours a day to get the, the book done. So by the end of the month, it was the day after Thanksgiving, I was getting close to the end. Marcy the typist came in late that afternoon and we were writing into the night. It was about nine or 10 o'clock at night. And I was just writing the line, thunder and lightning ripped the sky. And just as I finished writing it, this intense blast of lightning and huge thunderclap just whammed into the building the facing on the air conditioning unit blew off the unit, flew across the room and hit me in the back and all the lights flickered and went out. And uh, Marcy jumped up and screamed and we didn't know what was going on. Um, after about half a minute or a minute, the lights flickered and went on and then all the video games in the room started playing themselves. <laughs> Meanwhile, Spielberg was up against another kind of scary force, the Motion Picture Association of America. The ratings board was concerned about the movie's graphic violence. The first rating for, for Poltergeist was an R, which was the kiss of death back in the 80s. Steven Spielberg and Frank Marshall knows where their money comes from during the summer blockbuster season, you know, and that's from young kids who are willing to go to see movies over and over and over again. MGM really needed to have um, an, a PG rating. Spielberg and MGM executives weren't about to give in. There's no nudity in it. You know, there's there's no there's no horrific language. Um, even the even the violence that happened is you know it, it's scary, but it's not but it's tame. So Frank Marshall and Stephen pleaded with the ratings board to get a PG. The producers got their wish, and Poltergeist was rated PG. But Spielberg's problems were far from over. In April 1982, the trailer for Poltergeist hit movie theaters all over the country. The ad campaign promoted the film as a Steven Spielberg production. Director Toby Hooper 
was furious. Because of this ensuing controversy over who really directed the film, you know, obviously Toby felt, you know, a little short shrifted. Spielberg responded with a full page ad in Daily Variety, complimenting Hooper's work as the director of the project. But audiences didn't care who directed Poltergeist. The movie opened on June 4th, 1982, and the weekend box office take was almost $7 million. The reviews were equally impressive. Six-year-old Heather O'Rourke was thrilled. And she predicted even then, she was pressed, this is going to be a huge hit. How are we ever going to top it? Coming up... Sweeney beat the crap out of her. She thought she was going to, going to die. On June 4, 1982, the film Poltergeist released its terror on audiences nationwide. That weekend, Steven Spielberg's ghost story ruled at the box office, but the movie's success would soon be overshadowed by tragedy and violence. Poltergeist turned Heather O'Rourke into a celebrity. With uh, the popularity of Poltergeist, there was nowhere that Heather could go or not go where she would not be recognized. Well, one thing Heather told me, she said, I don't know why people want my autograph. It's just my name I'm writing. So she just, and I explained to her, well, well she was love with, she liked Sylvester Stallone. So I said, well, if you got someone's autograph you really like, was that important? She said, oh, yes. I said, well, that's how you were to other kids. So she never refused an autograph, and she could understand all that. She was never rude or anything, but she didn't think she was anything special. The movie hit home with audiences. The strangest people were the people after the movies who kept saying, well, that happened to me. What happened in the movie happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, really, thank you for, for portraying it so accurately. <laughs> they recognized me in the street. They stopped me in the aisles of the supermarket and said, could you please take a look at my house? No, ma'am, I, I can't. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Poltergeist seemed on track to be the summer's biggest hit until Spielberg's other movie, E.T., was released one week later. The picture shattered box office records and put Poltergeist in its place. E.T. just kind of trumped it, you know, but it trumped everything in its path. E.T. was one of those, you know, spectacular blockbusters for, for the ages. Although Poltergeist was no longer number one at the box office, the movie put its young stars on the map. The career of 22-year-old Dominique Dunn was taking off. She was set to appear in the upcoming TV series, V. She was really brilliant, smart, uh, you know, uh, talented, easy to get along with, full of enthusiasm because she was just starting her career. Dominique's love life was also moving full steam ahead. Her boyfriend, 26-year-old John Sweeney, was a successful chef. The couple appeared happy, but they were dealing with demons of their own. Michael Feig worked with Sweeney at Ma Maison restaurant in West Hollywood. First impression of John was high energy. He was always moving. Bit of a temper, you know, and they didn't really want to set it off or aggravate him or anything. Sweeney had a short fuse. When a fan complimented Dominique on her performance in Poltergeist, Sweeney reportedly attacked him. Just a few months later, Dominique became the victim of one of Sweeney's jealous rages. Dominique's friend, actor Miguel Ferrer. Sweeney beat the crap out of her. She thought she was gonna, gonna die. He choked her unconscious, banged her head on the floor, did all this. I, I was absolutely blown away. One month later, Dominique and Sweeney fought again. This time, the young actress took action. Friend, Gloria Gifford. He tried to hurt her, and she knew he was really doing something bad. And it was after that that she told me that she said she was separating from him, that they were going to take a time away from each other. But Sweeney didn't take no for an answer. According to police reports, on the night before Halloween, the chef carved a chocolate mask in Dominique's likeness and delivered it to her door. Dominique was rehearsing lines with actor David Packer when Sweeney made his surprise visit. Former LAPD detective Harold Johnston. John Sweeney came up, knocked on the door, asked her to let him in so he could talk to her. She declined. She then came outside with him to talk to him. Mr. Packer said he then heard loud noises and loud conversation from, coming from the front porch. Packer later testified that he tried to ignore the argument. He turned on the poltergeist soundtrack to drown out the noise. 
Then he heard Dominique scream. At that time, Mr. Uh, Packer said he went to the telephone, telephoned a friend, and he left a message on the answering machine that, and said, if I die tonight, John Sweeney did it. In a panic, Packer phoned the police. Police personnel who answered the telephone told him that if he was any kind of a man, that he would go out and help uh, Miss Dunn. But Packer didn't go outside. A few steps away, Dominique was fighting for her life. Prosecuting attorney Stephen Barshop. Sweeney grabbed uh, Dominique Dunn by the neck. He grabbed her, pulled her off the porch, pulled, pulled her to uh, the, the side of the house and uh, was strangling her. It took approximately four minutes. When the sheriff's deputies first arrived, Mr. Sweeney walked out to them with his hands up. He then walked back here and lay down beside Miss Dunn. Dominique was rushed to Cedars Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, where she slipped into a coma. Our emotions were uh, would swing from absolute despair to, come on, she's still she's still here. As long as she's still here, there's still a chance. It's going to be okay. But it wasn't going to be okay. After four days, Dominique Dunn was taken off life support and declared officially dead. Family and friends were devastated. She was a wonderful up-and-coming young star and uh, you know when she was killed we were stunned we were just stunned because that had been such a, a life force um, so that was really a tragedy John Sweeney faced murder charges his trial began on July 19 1983 in the Santa Monica Superior Court author Makita Brotman John Sweeney came into court looking very, very contrite. He was wearing a, a black suit, um, clutching a Bible, looking like a student in a Catholic seminary. He looked down. Um, he was very, um, just very pensive and contrite throughout the whole trial. Sweeney testified that he strangled Dominique Dunn in the heat of passion. He put on a tearful display. On November 10th, 1983, after a six-week trial, the jury returned with its verdict. Sweeney was convicted of voluntary manslaughter and sentenced to six years in prison. He served in the end uh, two and a half years, and that was a very, um, very controversial, you know, for someone who killed his, strangled his girlfriend with his bare hands. After Dominique's tragic death, an urban legend was born, the curse of Poltergeist. To a certain extent, there were um, close similarities between events in the film and events outside the film, so I think that's Real, that really began to fuel the curse. Coming up, an actor's last rites. And I said that he needs to do this for a soul. I knew he wasn't going to live long. In the summer of 1982, the movie Poltergeist became a box office hit. But the picture's success was tainted by the vicious killing of one of the film's young stars, Dominique Dunn. Despite rumors that the film was cursed, MGM executives rushed to put a Poltergeist sequel into production. Producers Steven Spielberg and Frank Marshall and director Toby Hooper weren't interested in Poltergeist 2, but nothing could keep screenwriters Mark Victor and Michael Grace away, not even the so-called curse of Poltergeist. We had heard of the uh, Poltergeist curse and we knew of the tragedy that had occurred on the first film. We did not really believe that it had to do with uh, the subject matter of the movie or that the movie was itself cursed in any way. So we were, we were very upset about what had occurred, but we didn't feel that it was going to follow us you know, from one movie to the other. Little did we know. The, uh, in Poltergeist 2, there were some pretty strange moments, as it turned out. Victor and Grace also signed on as producers of Poltergeist 2. They finished their screenplay in the spring of 1983. There was just one hitch. What we realized was n nobody in the first movie had been signed to do a second movie. There was some question whether Joe Beth and Craig T would come back and do the sequel. So it took a lot of politicking and, and our will and persuasiveness to uh, get them back. 
and because uh, they had thriving careers. MGM gave the actors a very good reason to sign on. Well, the money. I mean, it was great. And, uh, you know, I never made a check like that in my life. They made me a financial offer that I couldn't refuse. And I read the script, and it was Craig again and the kids again. And um, read the script and thought it was actually very interesting. Uh, so I agreed to do it. Victor and Grace accounted for Dominique Dunn's absence by sending her character away to college. But they knew that they needed Heather O'Rourke. Heather O'Rourke was really excited to be involved in Poltergeist 2. She was older. She was seven by then. She understood the business much better. She had already had a lot of credits under her belt. So at this point, it was going back to work with old friends and uh, continuing a role that is a part of history. Oliver Robbins and Zelda Rubenstein were back as well. Now, all the producers needed was a director. In 1984, Brian Gibson was a young filmmaker looking for his big break. Psychic Jill Cook told the director he wouldn't have to wait long. I went to New York and I read this young producer named Brian Gibson. And I said, you're gonna get your first movie. And it's not what you think. It's gonna be a movie, a spiritual movie. He didn't believe me. He, I was, you know, I was like, you're just telling me what I wanna hear. I met Jill Cook. Um, some months earlier through a producer in New York called Jill Paperno and then I kind of forgot about it. In the spring of 1985, Jill Cook's prediction came true. Brian Gibson had been recommended to us as a director to look at by the studio and we uh, saw he had done one small film, Breaking Glass, for the BBC and Brian came in and we just hit it off with him. I think he told us in his initial interview that he had been told by a psychic that he would get the job of director of Poltergeist 2. And we... We didn't trust him when he said that. <laughs> <laughs> we thought, okay, he's just crazy enough to do this. <laughs> Gibson got the job and immediately called Jill Cook. He said, I got a movie and I want you to help. I'm like, oh, that's great, I'd love to help. What's the movie? He said, Poltergeist 2. I went, oh! I absolutely loved the movie, the original, the first one. Cook was signed as the film's official psychic advisor. She began consulting with the filmmakers over the phone. I think uh, what we'd like to do is, is uh, get guidance on this uh, idea that um, we've just started to uh, talk about. But do you think it would be a good idea to kind of just do a reading? I'm going to begin with a prayer because I believe in the power of prayer. And I believe if you ask, you shall receive. And if you knock, the door shall be opened. And if you seek, you shall find. What I would do is mostly concentrate on the spiritual side of it, how realistic that is. When I received the original script, the ending was they killed the spirit with a baseball bat. And I laughed. I said, well, the ending's no good. You can't kill the spirit with a baseball bat. <laughs> so that we worked on the ending. Cook may have hated the ending, but she loved a new character who was added to the poltergeist mix, a mystical shaman named Taylor. The writers based the role on a friend of actor Craig T. Nelson. The character of the Indian um, was really inspired by Craig's relationship with uh, an Indian that he had met when he lived in Mount Shasta. That the guy had revealed to him quite a bit spiritually and that uh, he had grown a bit from it. Creating the character of Taylor was easy, Finding an actor that fit the part was a bit more difficult. I wanted an authentic American Indian. Uh, I wanted someone who was a good actor, who had a sort of power, personal and spiritual power about them. I know Brian had a hard time casting that role, and they, they looked at a ton of people. Well, we had a lot of people come in for the part of uh, the Indian and Poltergeist to uh, just about every actor in town was coming in claiming that he was uh, at least part Indian, including Dennis Hopper, who claimed he was an Apache or something. Gibson called upon his psychic advisor for help. Brian talked to me about hiring the actors. He'd give me a list of names of actors to pick. I really didn't know who the actors were. I don't know what, at the time when they'd say a name who this person was. I just write them down and say, no, no, and then I'd say, well, this person's this. I'd give comments on some of the people, and some would just say no and go on. Cook zeroed in on one candidate, Will Sampson. 
The actor was best known for his role in the 1975 movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I picked him because he's a spiritual master. I knew his heart. And that's why when I read people, I read their heart. The filmmakers were skeptical until they met Sampson in person. When Will Sampson came in, he was the real McCoy. And he was, in fact, uh, the shaman for several tribes, I've been told. And he just was the character. And it was, wasn't even a question. The psychic made believers out of the filmmakers. They were so thrilled, they asked Jill to find an actor to play the part of the evil minister, Cain. The psychic picked Julian Beck, author Makita Brotman. Julian Beck was a very well-known actor. In fact, he was most well-known for his work in theater. He and his wife, Judith Molina, had um, um, started this very famous theater group called The Living Theater. But Jill wasn't interested in the actor's resume. I said that he's, he needs to do this for a soul. I knew he wasn't going to live long. And I didn't even know who he was. I mean, I had no pictures, nothing. And so that was sort of, you know, something I knew spiritually was right for this man. I knew that this would be the last movie he did, would do. I know these kind of things. He's very ill. Um, he, I don't think, would normally have done something like that if he hadn't been so ill. But he was saving a little for posterity, I think. I talked to him a little about why, being so ill, he wanted to uh, do this very taxing role. Because he knew he was dying. And uh, he said it was to rid himself of certain things. Uh, that in playing the role of the epitome of fear, the epitome of death, the epitome of evil, uh, that it would give him a kind of courage. I'll never forget the first reading when everyone was sitting around casually uh, reading their parts and their lines and all of a sudden Julian Beck spoke out and the level of everything and everyone around it all of a sudden just went up. It was like, uh-oh, we better get into this seriously now and pay attention because this guy is really powerful. Just before filming of Poltergeist 2 kicked off, psychic Jill Cook made one final prediction. I made the prediction there would be three Poltergeist films and no more. Little did I know why, but I just knew there'd be three. But now I know why. Coming up, cameras roll and the curse continues. He said, I think these skeletons somehow contain something. Uh, this set me as an exorcism. Strange occurrences and bizarre accidents seem to haunt the cast and crew of the movie Poltergeist. But the producers of the sequel were convinced the so-called curse of Poltergeist was nothing more than a silly urban legend. The cast and crew weren't so sure. In the summer of 1985, filming began on Poltergeist 2. The movie's budget was $19 million, nearly twice as much as the original. Director Brian Gibson was tense. On the first day of filming, I'm always nervous uh, because there's a lot going on and a lot of pressure. We arrived on the set and there was like a crew of 150. I mean, it was amazing. And he was white as a ghost. And we just were, you know, like, Brian, it's going to be okay. Just get that first shot and then everything will be okay. But getting the first shot took much longer than expected. Actor and real life shaman Will Sampson delayed production for hours by performing a Muscogee Indian blessing on the set. The movie's paranormal advisor, Kevin Ryerson. From what I understood is that it was an invocation for best performances. Uh, it was less the idea of, of chasing away negative spirits than it was the invoking of the positive spirit that is universal in each and every person. Will Sampson did a lot of blessing on our set <laughs> and all of it helped because it was a big production and um, we appreciated all the blessings we could get. We were rookie producers and a blessing from anywhere was a good blessing. The blessings worked, and production moved along smoothly for a while. But all that changed when it came time to film Craig T. Nelson's scene with a creature named the Vomit Monster. The monster was going to grow inside of me, then come out. And they had an air hose, and they had some kind of a plasma system that was going to be injected, and I was supposed to 
as it came out and blew up inside of my mouth, let it out. It wasn't a scene that Craig was looking forward to doing, I can tell you that. There was a, a lot of reluctance about it and, uh, and, and, and conversation about it. Some guy who's 14 years old comes and says, you know, this is really going to work. We've practiced it on, in, the, in the trailer for like hours and hours, and we know, and then they turn it on, you know, and it's not working. Well, that's not supposed to happen. I guess we'll have to re reevaluate. Are you sure that you're holding your tongue in a 45 degree angle against the tubes? I remember everybody trying, trying desperately to keep a straight face because he was so funny and, and they had a thing that was coming out. And he kept saying, does it look phallic? And we'd all go, no, Craig, no, it looks fine. <laughs> But the stunt became less and less entertaining as problems continued. You're there, you know, six hours later wondering, why are we keep, we're, we're doing this again? You know, and it just didn't work. And it uh, didn't look right. Brian didn't like it. And one thing led to another. And finally, the thing, you know, did something. I mean, it did what it was supposed to do, kind of. Late that night, director Brian Gibson finally decided he had his shot. The exhausted crew wrapped for the day, but the next morning, the crew received some bad news. Director of photography, Andrew Laszlo. Something did go wrong with the camera, and the film got scratched and exposed by light, and we had to redo that scene again, much to the consternation of everybody involved, including Craig Nelson, who had to go through this whole gross situation. There were more problems to come. In the summer of 1985, the cast and crew prepared to shoot the movie's dramatic finale. For the scene, an MGM soundstage was transformed into an enormous underground cavern. Frightening. It must have been very authentic. It's the kind of thing I have no intention of investigating. I would never, in nature, go into such a cavern. The set was more than just uncomfortable. It was dangerous. It was a very tricky set. It was a very difficult set. And I remember it had very low ceilings, and people kept running into things and banging their heads, and cameras falling. People tripping and falling, people getting sick. There was a lot of electrical stuff going on, I remember. There was reels running out. There was camera jams. The film was uh, somehow demagnet. I don't know what it was doing, but it was blanking out when they were like, uh, processing it. The first day we shot footage, the uh, footage turn, didn't turn out at all. It was black. And uh, the studio we'll was really yeah. happy about that. Skeptics argue that it could have been a, a pre, you know, exposure to sunlight. Given the professionalism on the set, I'm not certain that those explanations could have occurred. That type of fogging is very typical of uh, poltergeist phenomena. No one could figure out why the problems were occurring. Anything that happened was immediately assigned some kind of a supernatural explanation. Production slowed to a crawl. The filmmakers were afraid that they wouldn't be able to finish the scene or the movie. Actor Will Sampson had fears of his own. So we were on that soundstage for a long, long time, and, and things were not going well. We were getting way behind, so... Will went in and, and he detected, he felt that there was some alien spirits that were upset. And he detected it in the skeletons that were there. The special effects department then revealed a shocking fact. The skeletons used in the movie were real. Even the producers were surprised. What we do is ask for skeletons to be, you know, around the set. and. Uh, where they get the cadavers from, we uh, hadn't investigated, but I guess we were told that at a point that some of them were real and that they weren't happy. We weren't happy either. Neither was Craig T. Nelson. He was very, very uncomfortable. He came to me sweating, very uncomfortable, and he said, there is a peculiar energy in this, in this set, and I, I can't go in on much longer. I, I need an exorcism. I think these skeletons somehow contain something 
uh, this set needs an exorcism. And Will said, well, just make sure they leave the stage door open for me tonight, and I'll come back and I'll take care of it. And he says, the spirits are not happy. And so we said, all right. And when we told the, uh, you know, the security that they had to leave the stage door open for Will Sampson so he could come and, you know, do a blessing on the set, they rolled their eyes, but they accommodated us. At four o'clock in the morning, Sampson entered the poltergeist soundstage and performed an exorcism. Whatever it was, it worked, and there wasn't any problem after that. Now, that's what happened. So I don't know. Yeah, me, you know. I just know that nothing happened and it was good. Coming up. He delivered the line the way he did because he knew that he was going to die. In 1985, the production of Poltergeist 2 proved to be another nerve-wracking experience for cast and crew. Special effects didn't work, fake skeletons turned out to be real, and the actors demanded an exorcism to clear the set of evil spirits. But the worst was yet to come. Two months into production, everyone on the Poltergeist 2 set was exhausted by the grueling schedule. One cast member in particular was growing weaker by the day. Julian Beck paid the um, role of the minister who comes back from the dead and comes to haunt the uh, Freeling family. He was uh, terminally ill at the time when we did the filming with him, and he looked like he was terminally ill. It was clear that he was ill because he, he I think he had stomach cancer, and he couldn't really take in solid food, so he was being fed like you know a number of times during the day he'd go and have I don't, I don't know if it was an IV or if they fed him through a tube and yet his spirit was extraordinary just extraordinary and his wife I remember his wife saying to me that it was so great for him to do this because he loved being around actors he loved making movies and uh, and that even though he was ill it was wonderful that he could still work Despite his failing health, Beck was a major force on the set. He was great at creating uh, terror. Uh, you know, the moment through the wire mesh of the door when he wants to get into the house is a very scary moment um, because you feel the power of his need, let me in, let me in. Let me in. You're gonna die in there! All of you! You're gonna die! You know, we looked at this man who looked like he was about to die, telling us that you're all going to die. And some of the people claimed that they were very affected by it. But it might be that he delivered the line the way he did because he knew that he was going to die. In the fall of 1985, Poltergeist 2 wrapped and everyone breathed a sigh of relief. There were some strange things that happened and they, they were, there were more strange things that happened than happened on most movies. So it was a marvelous kind of end of school, end of task feeling about the last day of shooting. Brian Gibson w wrote me a beautiful um, thank you letter wanted to verify that I am gifted and that I am truly helpful and I got a good heart. Sadly, another of Jill Cook's premonitions came to pass a few months after filming wrapped. On September 17, 1985, actor Julian Beck succumbed to cancer. As Cook predicted, Julian survived only long enough to finish Poltergeist 2. I just remember being over on the lot and somebody came over and said he had passed away. And, was, it, and you're immediately sad because you spent a lot of time together in a very intense situation. And uh, at least with us personally, he was, he was just lovely and incredibly professional and, uh, you know, and a rare talent. He was gifted. Julian Beck's funeral was held on September 20th, 1985. 
But the veteran actor still had some earthly affairs to wrap up. I was on the phone to this psychic, Jill Cook. She suddenly said, there's, there's someone on the phone right now who says he's in the movie. And she said, uh, this, his name is Julian. He has a message for his wife. I said, OK, what's the message? And she said, the message is, don't forget the double-winged eagle. And uh, I said, oh, thank you, thank you. I had to talk to Judith Molina, Julian's wife, a few days later. So I, I said, uh, do you believe in the hereafter, Judith? And she said, what, have you heard something from Julian? And I said, well, yeah, and I told her the story. And I said, you know, he sent this message, don't forget the double-winged eagle. And there was a sort of chilling silence, and she said, well, that's what's on the frontispiece of all Julian's poetry. Beck won rave reviews from the critics, but they found little else to praise when Poltergeist 2 premiered in May of 1986. Poltergeist 2 was really um, a really bad imitation of the first one, you know, just a bad Xerox, you know, and it's not necessarily a copy. I mean, obviously it's sort of set, you know, in a different place and what have you. Movie audiences, however, didn't care about reviews. Poltergeist 2 eventually took in a respectable $41 million at the box office. MGM executives were pleased. Meanwhile, 10-year-old Heather O'Rourke was struggling with a mysterious ailment. The doctor says, well, maybe it's just the flu. Well, she'd gone to school the first day, come home, and her legs and feet were swollen twice the size. I took her back to Kaiser, and Kaiser says, well, maybe something bit you. So we came back home again. They finally, after the second day, they admitted her to the hospital. Agent Bob Preston. Everyone was concerned with Heather's health. So every doctor that was a specialist, we would send her to. And the studios were concerned with her, and the parents were concerned with her health. Uh, but no one could put their finger on what it really was. They thought of a couple things, and they subscribed, uh, prescribed a couple things that they thought would fix it, uh, but it didn't. Despite her illness, Heather continued to work. The young star was signed to appear in a TV movie called Surviving, manager Mike Meyer. She had worked through it. She was the kind of person who would never complain and would always bring her most professional attitude no matter what she was facing. But Heather wasn't the only cast member who fell ill. On June 3, 1987, the cast of Poltergeist suffered another loss. Will Sampson, who played the role of the shaman, died from complications during a heart and lung transplant. When I heard that he had passed, I was, I was deeply saddened and very shocked because he had seemed like, you know, a big strapping guy, not that ill. He was buried in the reservation and, and so I happened to be in the area and I wanted to pay my respects to him and so they had given me directions how to get to the place where he was but I couldn't find it. I've been out there four and a half, five hours looking. I finally just stopped off at the store and I said, you know, I'm looking for, for uh, Will Sampson of where he was buried and <laughs> the guy next to me is his cousin in line. The cousin led Nelson to Sampson's gravesite. I can remember vividly there was a the reservation burial ground and will had, had been interred maybe at two days and the cicadas were like just it was a, a cacophony of sound it was, and i walked up and i said hey will it's craig and immediately it was this still just went really still and i said come on we kind of laughed and it was pretty amazing. Coming up. And action. We're back. By the end of 1986, Poltergeist 1 and 2 were both successful at the box office. MGM execs didn't care about the curse of Poltergeist, just the bottom line. Poltergeist 3 was about to materialize. The studio brass had no idea what they were in for. MGM executives approached producers Mark Victor and Michael Grace about Poltergeist 3. Both of our heads hit our desks. The thought of going uh, 
back into poltergeist land again that quickly was uh, something that we weren't able to do. So studio execs turned to Gary Sherman, a veteran writer and director best known for the film Wanted Dead or Alive. MGM approached me about coming in to write, produce, and direct Poltergeist 3. You know, the, the, the rumors and, 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 and legends about the curse of Poltergeist it really didn't bother me a lot. Sherman focused on the cast, not the curse. The first cast member they wanted, uh, made the offer to return, was Heather O'Rourke. As far as the other cast members, they said, you know, there could be a cost factor involved, but if we get Heather, we know we can come up with a movie. Heather signed on, but the rest of her on-screen family passed. Desperate to secure at least one more original cast member, Sherman hunted Zelda Rubenstein down at a Los Angeles movie premiere. Please, I'm Gary Sherman. It'll be my pleasure to direct you in Poltergeist 3. I didn't even know there was going to be a Poltergeist 3. And he was so utterly charming. I just, you know, I said, I'm yours. The director then cast Tom Skerritt as Carol Ann's uncle and Nancy Allen as her aunt. There was a rumor, there, it was really kind of creepy in a way, there was something about that people had died, there were certain people associated with movies. I remember hearing something about that and I didn't think about it too much. 18-year-old <laughs> newcomer Lara Flynn Boyle won the role of Carol Ann's cousin Donna. But Sherman didn't just change the main characters of Poltergeist 3. He also moved the action from the suburbs to the city. A lot of times they'll, you'll take horror films and, and, and thrillers and people will move them into isolated places because they feel they can build fear with isolation. I think it's more frightening to know that something is going on on the other side of a wall and that nobody cares. Chicago's landmark skyscraper, the John Hancock Tower, became Carol Ann's new home. Heather O'Rourke was eager to start the movie, but her family was concerned about her health. Manager Mike Meyer. She'd been sick for two years. And when they went to Chicago for Poltergeist 3, they were in fact dealing with stomach specialists. And they had gone through a series of possible diagnoses and for each step in the diagnosis, there'd been a different remedy that was suggested. They determined that she had Crohn's disease from the symptoms of throwing up, so they put her in a cortisone. In the spring of 1987, Heather O'Rourke arrived on the set of Poltergeist 3. Heather O'Rourke um, started production on Poltergeist 3. There was a sadness where the other cast members uh, were not returning, but yet this was a job, and uh, she went forward with it. Heather O'Rourke loved to act. We're back. The set was unlike anything the actors had ever seen before. Gary Sherman planned to do all of his special effects live, using a complicated system of mirrors, body doubles, and duplicate rooms. Every set that was built with a mirror in it, the set was duplicated in reverse through the mirror. Everyone had a double. One and the doubles would be doing exactly what the principal characters were doing. The intricate shots were difficult to pull off. The actors and the crew were constantly struggling to get it right. A lot of times there'd be mirrors to wherever we were and then there'd be the doubles, the, the body doubles. So, and you'd all, you'd, all these moves were choreographed. So it was just, it was a very eerie kind of thing. Soon enough, Cameraman George Kohut noticed a disturbing coincidence. The 666 thing is strange because our, at that time our union local number was 666. So I was sort of used to that. Yeah, during production, Gary lived at 666 North Lakeshore Drive. And then the strange accidents began again. Early in production, stuntman Corey Eubanks was testing an underwater catapult designed to launch actors out of a swimming pool and into the air. Stunt coordinator, Ben Scott. You press the button and the thing didn't go off, so he's starting to float, your body starts to float. And he tries to swim out of the way and the thing went off, and bam, hit him right in the shins. Sliced his shins up, it was, it was a pretty bad deal. The engineer at the John Hancock building who was assigned to help us on the show 
was sitting in the lobby one night when we were shooting and sitting very still and ended up that he had passed away. I feel very guilty about Gary breaking his leg because in fact I fell into Gary and drove his foot under the dolly and that's how his leg got broken. Things only got weirder for Sherman and company. While shooting publicity photos before one of her scenes, Zelda Rubinstein was overcome by a strange premonition. She said, like a bolt of lightning went through me. I just felt like really strange for a second. I said, you know, you want to work? And she said, oh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. So we start setting up to do the scene. And uh, Barry Bernardi, the producer, comes down to the production office and pulls me aside on the set and says, we have a problem. We're going to have to lose Zelda because we just got a call that her mother just passed away. I've always had an unusual connection with my mother. And when I was called out of, from the set to go to the business office, I knew that my mother had died. Proof sheets come back from the gallery shoot. And we're looking through them. In the middle of all of this, there is one photograph that has light everywhere. And it's all out of focus, and it's all weird, and, and it's like multiple images. And we're trying to figure out what this is, and we're all looking at it and saying, oh. Anyhow, uh, it, it looked like a light leak in the camera or something. We had the negative analyzed and everything. Nobody could ever figure out what it was. It just was like this cosmic thing that happened. And obviously, this was the moment that Delta's mother had passed away. Coming up, the set becomes a living hell. That smoke's pretty bad, and it's starting, you know, burn your throat and your nose and your eyes. The production of Poltergeist 3 was plagued by accidents and strange occurrences. But the cast and crew didn't give up. Still, no one was prepared for the real life disaster about to take place. On set, director Gary Sherman continued to push Tom Skerritt and Nancy Allen. Every time they'd say, you know, okay, it's time for you to go to the set, and it was like going to my execution. It was so horrible. Running, being chased by cars, screaming, crying, you know. <laughs> it was just very effective, but it wasn't fun to shoot. Sherman even asked his cast and crew to stand on a window washing rig suspended from the top of the John Hancock building. Tom Skerritt found the idea terrifying. He says, unless you are within two feet of me at any given time, I'm not going. Because if you're not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. I said, you're not really, you're not going to put us out there, are you? You're not really going to put us out, you know, whatever it was, a hundred stories up in the sky. Stuntman Ben Scott was worried too. He knew that the building had its own deadly legacy. When I met uh, the guy that ran the uh, window washing rig, he said that when they were building the Hancock Tower, a man died for every floor that was put up. I mean, like 109 guys died building that thing. Sherman and his cast and crew got on the rig and prepared themselves for the worst. We first started going out towards that edge, and I started hearing it. Yeah, the wind was coming full on, like you're standing in front of a huge fan. Everybody, you know, would look at me and go, are you sure this is OK, Ben? This is safe, you've been out here and done this before. And he just said, don't look down, don't look down. <laughs> of course, I had to look down, you know. It's like, you have to. It was just horrible, absolutely horrible. The filmmakers pulled the scene off without a hitch. But they weren't so lucky with the next scene. In the summer of 1987, the crew prepared to shoot the most difficult and dangerous stunt of the movie. We were shooting the uh, frozen garage scene, and when Kane's car explodes, this was going to be a very big explosion in a confined space with lots of combustible materials around. Dangerous was stamped all over it. Every possible safety precaution was taken for the shoot. Everyone was moved out except the four or five special effects guys. We had the firemen all in there with their hoses primed at every exit. Every, they were only inches off camera at any point. And the idea was is that once the explosion went and the fireball came, as soon as the fireball hit camera, I would yell a cut. They were supposed to move in with the fire hoses and put out the fire. Simple. 
it was rehearsed, it was rehearsed again, and it was rehearsed again. Assistant cameraman Peter Kuttner. All safety had been taken care of. We felt safe. We didn't think we were in, in any danger. So here we go. We're doing it. I yell, action. The explosion goes off. And it is beautiful. And that fireball just comes rolling right towards the cameras, absolutely obscures everything. And I yell, cut. All the doors that led down into the garage open. And who comes running out? The firemen. The explosion scared the hell out of them and they just dropped their hoses and ran. Stuntman Ben Scott was inside the parking garage and witnessed the explosion firsthand. That cloud was full of fire and smoke and it was black and ominous and big and scary. I mean, my first reaction was duck, here it comes, get underneath it. And I saw the firefighters legs over there and the cars burning over there and the hose sitting in between them that was charged and ready to put out the fire. but. Nobody to uh, man the hose. Scott followed the firefighters out of the garage. I mean, the fire department was there. They were just standing there watching it burn. And the, the mayor's standing there, and he says, just let it burn, just let it burn. It'll go out. It'll go out. It's all concrete down there. Sherman realized that a maintenance worker was still in the parking garage. The director yelled at the firefighters to help, but the men didn't move. Then Scott did. My wheels started spinning and my adrenaline was pumping, so I ran back the way I'd come out and went down in there and find the, uh, the maintenance man. He goes, what happened? What's going on? I said, come with me. Come on, let's go. And that smoke's pretty bad, and it's starting you know, to burn your throat and your nose and your eyes. So I took off my T-shirt and wrapped it around my face, and he had a jacket he wrapped around his face. Scott rescued the maintenance worker. Then he went back for the cameras. He took both cameras upstairs and handed them to the camera guy. said, here. And that's when Gary Sherman thought I was a hero for saving the camera and the film. Ben Scott was really a hero that night. The fire burned out. And the crew gathered to complete the film. Well, we still had quite a bit to shoot when Heather passed away. Our immediate gut reaction was to not finish the film. Um, but unfortunately, or whatever uh, money rules, and um, there had been a lot of money spent and basically we were told by the financial powers that be that either we finished the film or somebody else finished it. So um, I had to write a whole new ending for the picture. Sherman used a double to replace Heather and shot his new ending in one day. The effect that it had on the film, um, which I guess is almost irrelevant compared to the tragedy of her dying, but uh, um, the film ended up to be a totally different film than we had originally planned to make. Sherman was glad the experience was over. One of my favorite things to do is go up and sit in the front row of the theater and watch the audience, but I don't think I did that with Poltergeist 3. I don't think I wanted to sit through a screening of that with an audience. Gary Sherman wasn't the only one who stayed away from the theater. Critics viciously attacked the film, and Poltergeist 3 was a box office flop. The news was out the Poltergeist series was considered dead. But was it? 1988 wasn't a good year for Poltergeist fans. Heather O'Rourke passed away, and the series' latest installment, Poltergeist 3, was a big disappointment. Miraculously, Poltergeist came back from the dead for one more round. In September 1996, Poltergeist was resurrected for the small screen. The television series Poltergeist The Legacy aired on the cable network Showtime. Director Gary Sherman was hired to write and direct, but he didn't stick around for long. I think the series had an opportunity to be something that it didn't become. And I, I, I signed on to try and help move it in the direction that I thought would make it better. But um, my ideas and other people's ideas were not the same. Poltergeist The Legacy lasted four seasons. There may never be another reincarnation of Poltergeist, but the film made a lasting impact on fans and cast members. I get approached all the time by people that have seen it, and it's made an impression on them, which is one thing that you realize the impact that something like that has had. We had no idea it would be the phenomenon that it was. We thought it might be one of those movies that went right to drive-ins, you know. You just, we had no way of knowing. As for the curse of Poltergeist, 
There are those who believe it isn't over yet. In 1994, the Northridge, California earthquake rocked the quiet suburban street where the original film was shot. The only home that sustained any major damage was the poltergeist house. You need a scorecard to tally the catastrophes, accidents, and deaths that haunted the poltergeist series. The debate rages on, curse or coincidence. As far as the curse of poltergeist is concerned, I think that it just means that here are a series of uncanny coincidences and synchronicities and accidents that seem so unusual and so out of place that we can't really work out how to fit them into our um, sense of reasoning. I think that a movie can just feel wrong. Bullsh People want to have this mystery, this little extra fear in their lives. Listen, life is so scary these days. You don't need things like mysteries on the set of Poltergeist to add to it. I think when you're making a film, even when you're writing a film, uh, there's a certain kind of thought and energy that's put out. And that has power, has some kind of power. When you decide to create fiction, you need to take care Aware, about where it might drag your thinking and where it might drag your reality.